looking pretty springy out there. It's cold and it's wet and it's May 1st and all the snow has gone. There you go, Northeast Ontario out there. The lawn's even starting to green up, but she's cold and wet today. So it's kind of a somber day outside, but it's a good day in the shop. Why is it a good day? Because it's graduation day for me. Graduating from the T-dub to that beast right there. Everybody has to graduate sometime. So, I saw that Kawasaki had come out with this new S model for 2023. And uh, not that I'm really that short of a guy, but the new S model is for shorter riders with a smaller inseam, shorter inseam. And, uh, who wanna sit on a bike comfortably without rocking back and forth in the balls of their feet and uh, be flat-footed on the bike or a reason to be flat-footed on a bike and be in control of their bike. Well, I'll tell you, this new Kawasaki S model, it does all that, for me anyway. I've had a lot of bikes in my life, XR650, DRs, all the big stuff, all the tall stuff where, you know, you were kinda bobbing back and forth in the balls of your feet and uh, off-roady, more off-roady style four-stroke thumpers. Well, this thing here, it gets a big thumbs up, I think, in every category, this uh, new KLR. So here's what we got. We got the new S model, and you can tell that by the seat height and by the S right there, and S basically for a shorter rider. And Kawasaki has done a whole pile of good stuff on this bike. I just love it. I just think they hit a home run with this bike. I've always liked the big single thumpers and I've always liked the big Enduros. Mind you now, this bike here, this KLR, and all you guys know it if you know your KLRs and your four strokes and everything else, this is more for me. And overall, I think the KLR is more a back road, on road, logging road style enduro is where my DR650 I had and my XR650L, they're more bare bones version. They're more dirty. They are meant for dirt, more off road riding. They're lighter. You can throw them around a bit better and they got gobs of torque and they're substantially lighter than this tank. But where this KLR shines and that's all I want it for really is when I was going on road speeds with the T-Dub and all that, the T-Dub is a great bike. Don't get me wrong, I love the T-W. In fact, that's why it's still sitting here and it's not sold. I don't really want to sell it. I can honestly say I don't really want to sell my T-Dub, but it is not an open road bike. The T-W is good back roads, logging roads, the back of an RV, uh, mountain riding, anything like that, man, with guys where you're just going out to have fun off-road and all that, the TW shines. Great around city bike, small town bike, but it is not a highway bike, the TW. And I knew it wouldn't last forever, me driving the T-Dub, because I don't want to scream it on the highways at, you know, 90 to 100 kilometers an hour, 50 to 60 mile an hour. I think the bike only does 70 miles an hour on a good day, absolutely rugged. So I don't want to beat on the T-Dub, so I thought I'm going to upgrade anyway eventually. Well, then I got this beast right here. This is a 23 KLR 650 S model. It's got the lower seat height. First thing you'll notice on this KLR model is the low seat height. These things have a low seat height. You can throw your light right over this thing. And for me, I got a wedge in there under the kickstand. And there you go. You're sitting on this bike and my legs are absolutely, or my feet are absolutely flat footed on this bike right now. This bike fits me about as perfect as I could ask for, for a bike and sitting flat footed. Just, it's just the cat's ass. In fact, this KLR right here sits a, 
over two inches lower than your standard height KLR. So it makes a huge difference. It's got a seat height of like 32 millimeter, or sorry, 32 inches from the ground up. And uh, your standard KLR, it's another about 2.1 or 2.2 inches higher, which makes a huge difference, especially for me, you know, off-road or at a stoplight. Instead of one foot in it now, I got two feet on the ground. And uh, it's just ideal, the height of this machine for me. And fuel injection, I like that right away. Even though I come from a T-Dub, there's no difference between the two bikes, but I'm just saying, when you start the T-Dub up and uh, you're fooling with the carburetor, you let it warm up, they're finicky to start. You have to give them their chance to warm up a little bit. As where this machine here, you start this EFI KLR up, you don't fool around. You can just start it up and then you can get dressed. You can put your coat on, you can put your helmet on, you can walk around and the bike just sits here and putters away on EFI, which is really nice. This bike has a lot of features that I really like. And like I said, the TW is not a speed demon, but when I get it, a lot of guys will say, these are old tanks and they're not very powerful and they're slow and maybe they are. But coming from this TW to this 650 Kawasaki, it's like night and day for me. I can just feel the raw torque out of this 650, even going up these hills on the hard top roads up some of these mountain roads. Even when you're in fifth gear and you roll into it, this bike just keeps pulling. It just pulls from the bottom all the way to the top and I like that. And uh, it's just a different feeling and it keeps up with traffic nicely. This bike here cruising now at 60 miles an hour, this is a non-issue for me on the road because we've got the Trans Canada Highway out here, Highway 17, and that's a major corridor between the small town and the city. And if you wanna ride a motorcycle, you better be able to keep up with traffic on there because you got everything from logging trucks to people driving fast and speed and all kinds of vehicles on there. So you wanna be able to keep up, if not be able to pass on the highway. And this machine here does it all for me. But anyway, I just thought I'd show you the height of that thing. Hopefully you guys. Whoa. Well, that was on the plan. Oh my God. Okay. We're going to edit that out. A few accessories, of course, I added on this now. Maybe I should have went aftermarket. I don't know, but I liked what I seen because I seen the Kawasaki Adventure, but it was too high. So I thought I'm gonna get the accessories because they fit all the KLR models. So I bought the, all the OEM accessories for this thing. They call them frame sliders. I think Kawasaki calls these frame sliders. And uh, I bought those. The LED mounting light bar, I bought that. And the Kawasaki LEDs. I mean, all this, all this stuff is available aftermarket. And maybe knowing what I know now, I maybe would have bought, who knows, Tusk aftermarket, whatever. But anyway, I'm happy with these lights. They work good. And there you are. I just wanted this bike dressed up as the adventure model basically, but still have that short stature. So whatever the adventure model had and a few extras, I put hand guards on this, aftermarket hand guards on this and your lever guards. So when you wipe out, and I'm sure I'm gonna fall down sometime. And it's, and got, it's got, Kawasaki bags, these are the OEM bags on this bike. I think I could have made better choices. When I look at it, I think, I maybe should have went aftermarket bags, but anyway, I keep saying that. And because these bags are kind of small, these Kawasaki bags, they're good. But if you look at them, they're nice. They're kind of small though, but one thing they are is they fit perfect. I mean the fit and finish when you buy those. Right there. 
and they work good and they're easily removable. And if you want to take these off, they're fairly easily removable. I think. And they lock, they got their own, uh, basically key coded lock on them. That matches the ignition key. I put the Ramex phone holder up there because the odd time you may want to put your phone up there, whatever. And I put right there, that is, that reads your voltage while you're driving. And when you run that goes over 14 volts, about 14.2. It shows you the true output of the alternator on this thing, basically the charge system anyway. So it's showing 12 volts right now. You take this back and you got dual USB ports on that thing for your charging. So it does two functions. It gives you a readout, lets you know your charging system works and you can charge your phone on it. And typical KLR display for this year on here. It's got no gear indicator and a lot of guys complain about that and I think they should have put one on there too. And no tack. It's got your clock, your trip, your speedometer and your fuel. That's one good thing they did do though. They put that LCD fuel gauge on there, which is nice. And I've already put 325 kilometers on this bike this year, but the weather's been so shitty and uh, I'm not gonna have a lot of time once the weather gets good to be on this thing because uh, I've been out doing job quotes. I've got work already lined up from topsoil work and grading to driveway work already. The jobs are already starting to line up and I won't have time to be on this bike, not to start with. I'm gonna have to catch up on a few spring jobs, then I can get back on this bike. But one thing I notice I like about, the, I, lots, I like lots of things about this bike, but I like that fuel tank size. This thing here, what a blessing. I filled that to the top the other day. I had a little bit under a quarter tank and it took me $19.50, almost 20 bucks to fill this thing up. Not saying much about the fuel prices either, but the point is it's got a big tank as where this little guy, when you were out riding on the little T-Dub, you had to fill her up in town. And when you went for a lot of riding, uh, you really had to check your fuel. And uh, it was just nice. It's just nice to have a big tank and you don't have to worry about it. And as you guys can see, I got a Nelson rig bag on the back. And I never showed you guys, but I took in on a deal this winter, a DR650, brand new bike basically at 111 kilometers. And it had Nelson rig bags on it. So I stole the top bag off it, and I thought I'm gonna put it on this cup because I didn't want the DR650. I know, like I said, I know what those big off-road bikes are like, too high and uh, just too off-roady for me. I want something that's good for on and off-road. And this Kawasaki is much better on the road. So. Got a Nelson rig bag here, and they're kind of nice because uh, they come with a rain satchel inside there. And with this Nelson rig bag on here, you can actually undo the secondary zipper here. You can undo the secondary zipper on this Nelson rig bag, and you can extend it and make it higher to put a helmet inside if you want to. It just brings the whole height of the whole bag up if you want to put an extra helmet or whatever in there and you need the height. So it's kind of nice. And these bags are not expensive. I don't think this, I don't think this bag's worth more than 70 bucks Canadian, 75 bucks, this bag. And uh, it's nice, you can take it off and on. It's got quick attach straps on it and a handle. So if you wanted to take it inside, wherever, camp and motel room, whatever, you can just pop it off. Same with these bags. If you were parked and you wanted to take these bags inside at night, you just pop them off and carry them. And uh, that's what's nice about that bag there. So I put a few trinkets on this thing. And well, like I say, you guys may laugh, but this bike to me has plenty of power. I haven't driven any European bikes. 
I haven't drove any Beamers and KTM's newer stuff to find out how powerful and how smooth they really are. But you know what? I'm not into the European bikes, really. I'm just not. I've always had Japanese bikes, and maybe I'm missing out on a lot. I don't know. But I can tell you what I'm not missing out by not buying a European bike is the dealer networking on every corner. I know I'm not missing out on that. And the repairs you can do yourself in a shop or the breakdowns that you might get on a trail that's kind of within your capability. This Kawasaki here, just like that DR I got rid of, just like the TW here, this is all old school technology and the average guy can do some work on this Kawasaki. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to work on the Kawasaki. All your newer computerized KTMs and BMWs with a computer dash and all that, as you guys know, I don't want that. Everything I got's old school, and uh, the more electronics I can keep off of something, the happier I am. Now this Kawasaki, again, I think it's second year EFI or maybe third, don't quote me, I can't remember, it's either second or third year EFI on this. I do like the fuel injection, I will say that. And uh, one thing I may do with this KLR is I may get an FMF uh, slip-on for this thing. The, the silent slip-on, maybe a Q4, if they make a Q4 and a silent slip-on, I may get that and put it on this bike. I want a quiet FMF, that's something that's going to allow this bike to breathe a little bit better and we'll see where we go and we'll see what's out there and we'll see if you have to map it or you have to uh, put the computer this thing to adjust that mapping on this bike when you change that slip on. I don't know for sure. I'm not going to go to a whole header system. I'm just going to put a slip on on the pipe that's there because uh, as we all know, those are pretty heavy exhaust systems on there. So we'll see what happens that way, but that's what this year is going to entail for riding. And one other thing I did to this bike, just, just while I was fooling around on this, I took the side panel off here where the battery is behind here, because they come with an AGM battery, right? These ones come with uh, AGM battery, sealed battery, so I just ran like I do in everything. I put a, a uh, battery tender plug on here and I bought a new AGM style battery maintainer charger for this bike and actually for anything I got here that's AGM I went and I bought a new style charger for them which is just better for your batteries you never have to worry about overcharging or putting too much voltage to the battery for too long and boiling them you know cooking your battery you don't want to be doing that so anyway trickle charge cord on that just a few extra things I put on this bike and uh, I'm not done yet. Like I said, I might put a few more things in this, I don't know. One thing I notice about this KLR, this one, is when you're riding this machine, and it's quite noticeable, I noticed it right away, is your stance on the bike when your knees are up. You have to have a wide open leg stance on this bike. Just because of the size of this fuel tank on this bike, this is a wide fuel tank. Therefore, when you're on this bike and you're on the pegs, unlike any bike I've ever driven, my legs are basically like this. They are kind of V'd out a little bit. Not uncomfortably, but I'm saying it's a stance that uh, just takes a little bit of adjusting. and. Another thing Kawasaki did on this that I really, actually I like so many things about it. I love the wide bars. I like the width that these bars are apart. It fits me good. I like a wide bar like this. The sitting position for me is perfect. The bar width is perfect. I like it wide. But I will say this, something that's really nice on this bike that I'm not used to because I've never had it. I love the windscreen. I love the fairing that Kawasaki put out on these bikes this year. And the wind deflection that comes from this. I raise this windshield. This is an adjustable windshield. You could lower it or raise it. And I raised it to its highest position. And what a difference it makes. Just my riding height, because I sit down on the saddle on the seat, I am down, the windshield is up. And I can feel 
immediately the wind just just ripping over my head just slightly maybe even deflecting the top of my helmet ever so slightly maybe it could go a tiny bit more but it's very good where it is and when I sit up in the seat with my helmet and I go up I can feel that wind just smack that helmet if this fairing and this windshield I never dreamed that they could make such a difference on wind resistance while riding like this bike here I've taken it to 70 miles an hour, 65 to 70 miles an hour because I got to break it in. So you don't want to get on it all the time, but you do want to stretch it out a little bit, but not for long, just a little tiny bit and uh, wait for all your parts to get seated. You got to break these things in right. But anyway, this bike handles so good. I'm amazed at 60 to 70 miles an hour with wind. This bike tracks straight down the road. I find anyway, if it's not too windy, just normal riding and you're flying down the road, this Kawasaki right here with this windshield and this fairing in the front, it tracks beautifully down the road, bucking that wind out the side and around your legs and above your helmet. I'm pretty impressed. I can say that I never thought it would do what it does, but this fairing on the front of this KLR to me, it's a game changer compared to what I come from. And uh, I thought, wow, what a nice machine with that uh, fairing on the front. So that's another thing I really like about it. And I don't know if the older models got it, but it's got these uh, rubber mounted anti-vibe because of that big single. These things are rubber mounted, these handlebar vibration dampeners here, they work like a champ. Because when I'm driving down the road, if I take my hands off the bars, my one hand off the bar, and I'm driving down the road and I feel this, I can feel that buzz from that big single. And I can feel this thing, the harmonics that go into this rubber mounted dampener, you can feel them coming down the bars, right into this, bat, right into this uh, dampener. And it makes a huge difference. It is rubber mounted completely and it doesn't touch the handlebar anywhere. So it makes a big difference with the vibration and dampening of this. Now when you talk about uh, vibration and dampening, I do feel that vibration harmonic buzz about 50 miles an hour. Uh, 80 kilometers an hour in this bike, I can feel those harmonics and I can feel that vibration. That's where I feel it the worst. It's not overbearing by any means, but if you just get in the zone, and it's not a big zone, it's only a small zone of maybe five kilometers an hour or less where you can feel low harmonics. And uh, it does have some big single vibration to it. And uh, you can feel it, it's not bad. So I'm assuming that's why, well I know that's why Kawasaki put the bar dampeners, rubber mounted foot pegs, they got rubber on those foot pegs and it's thick rubber and it's spongy makes a big difference. So Kawasaki's tried everything to limit the amount of vibration ergonomically that the rider will feel going down the road. And it's actually, it's actually pretty good. It's pretty impressive. I can say overall, after riding almost 200 miles on this bike that uh, I don't have a lot of complaints. This is a nice bike. It's a fun bike to drive. It handles good. It's got all the raw single torque that I'm looking for. Right from the bottom end, when you roll on it, it's got the torque from the bottom to the top. And I like that. It's a, it's a huge difference. The bike doesn't have to rub out to be able to pull you up a hill. Now, another thing I see on this bike though, it's pretty tall in the gearing. First gear on this bike, I noticed as soon as I went on one of the roads back in here, the old logging roads and just kind of jimmied around a little bit. First gear is tall in this thing. When you let the clutch out, you're going. It's not like a little T-dub or, you know, any, anything with a uh, short shift in gear range. This bike has a tall gear range, so it's pretty fast in first gear, really. And that's something that, you know, you have to get used to. But the large majority of my riding up here in northeastern Ontario, if you guys watch those T-Dub videos, a lot of my riding is gravel side roads, concession roads here, 
and logging roads. And the logging roads are perfect for this bike. I've had it on multiple logging roads already. Just uh, roads that go nowhere into the timber and uh, for miles. And this bike here on gravel handles them perfectly. So I just thought I'd show you guys a little bit on this new KLR I bought. I've graduated from the TW200 and gone to the 650. And just to give you an idea on insurance, and these are real world numbers, you guys may say it's a lot or that's not bad. That TW200 was costing me 240 bucks a year. That TW200 was uh, 240 bucks a year. So I went and I got insurance, same company that I've been with forever, on this KLR for this year, 491. 491 bucks a year on this bike for insurance. I thought, not bad. Like, I don't know, I don't know uh, about you guys, what you pay on insurance, but if you're gonna play with this stuff, you gotta pay. Now, I was hoping it was gonna be down there. I, did, I honestly did not expect this bike to be under $500 insurance. I just didn't expect it. I thought this bike would be substantially higher than what it is, but you know what? I was pleasantly surprised at the insurance rate on this bike at 491 bucks a year. So, that's where we stand anyway from a financial aspect of insuring this bike. And uh, I think the sticker is free for these bikes up here in Northeast Ontario. I think you don't have to pay anything for these stickers up here, I think. That's where we are this year on the KLR, going from 200 to 650. And uh, it's a nice machine. I just thought I'd show you guys that, but I really can't show you anything now. Because have a look. It's just too, too shitty out there. That's typical spring weather right there. Wet and cool up here. All right, you guys. So I just th thought I'd show you these two bikes. And uh, we'll see what the future holds for the TW. I have my ideas. And we're going to see what happens. MJ is supposed to be going for her bike license. So I thought... This TW may be the perfect bike for her. It's a little bit heavy because we were talking Honda Grom or uh, Honda Monkey, but the monkeys are too expensive. We were thinking Honda Grom 125 just to start with where she can run from home and to town and back, get used to a low bike, learn how to shift properly and uh, just get the feel of a motorcycle first and then we could sell the Grom, just buy a used Grom, sell it, and then she can go to the TW and drive that. And then if she gets really comfortable on a motorcycle, we can upgrade to, you know, maybe something in the 400, 450, 500 class. We'll see what happens, but one step at a time. So anyway, guys, thought I'd show you the Kawasaki. I am very pleased with this bike. I have no complaints, for me anyway, and uh, it turned out to be a good purchase. I'm happy with it, and I can't wait to get it out some more. I'm just itching to go riding, but the weather just hasn't cooperated and the work's going to start to stack up here. So i got to start thinking about work versus tooling around, having a great time on a motorcycle that I love. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Thanks for tuning in.